Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to talk about a couple of the objections to the existence of God that are brought up by Thomas Aquinas, of all people. So as I've gone over in another video on the principle of charity, um, we ought to always characterize our opponent's arguments in the most charitable way possible. In other words, we ought to put their arguments, the arguments that we are arguing against, as strongly as we possibly can manage. This is so that when we argue against those points, when we seek to refute those points, we're not knocking down a straw man. Right? We're not committing the fallacy uh, of the straw man, uh, or even the related fallacy of the weak man. Um, again, all of these things are explained in other videos, which I will, of course, link below. Suffice to say, though, what we should be doing is characterizing our opponent's arguments as strongly as possible, so that if and when we do defeat them, we've actually accomplished something. We've managed to, uh, to make our case as strongly as possible against the strongest possible opponent. Uh, there's perhaps no thinker in uh, the Western philosophical tradition who does this more thoroughly than St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, in some of his quadlibital questions, he provides uh, upwards of 10 to 15 potential counter-arguments to his position, many of which are stated even more strongly than his opponents themselves state them. Unlike some uh, other questions, the question whether God exists only has two counter-arguments presented by Thomas Aquinas. However, they are incredibly strongly stated, and, as we go through them, you'll, uh, I'll draw your attention to the fact that these two counter-arguments are still in use, uh, probably the most commonly used arguments against the existence of God to this day, uh, all, we're over 700 years later, um, almost 750 years later at this point. So, keeping that in mind, I want to look at both of these and look at how um, how St. Thomas Aquinas responds to each of these objections. So to begin, um, he says, it seems that God does not exist, because if one of two contraries be infinite, the other would be altogether destroyed. But the word God means that he is infinite goodness. If therefore God existed, there would be no evil discoverable. But there is evil in the world, therefore God does not exist. This is a very straightforward uh, statement of what is called the problem of evil. Um, again, if God is infinitely good, if God is absolutely perfect, then we should expect nothing evil whatsoever in God's creation. There should be no evil in the world. Now, we'll go into different versions of this argument uh, in another video. Um, but for this point... Um, It's enough to point out here uh, that Aquinas is setting up a straightforward, logical contradiction. He's not saying that, well, we shouldn't expect the kinds of things that we would expect in, that, we, that we actually see in the world if God created the world. Uh, what he's saying here is that the existence of God, ultimate perfection, absolute goodness, is logically incompatible with the existence of evil. This seems intuitively obvious. If there are uh, two opposed forces, the only reason that they could stand opposed to one another is if neither is capable of completely defeating or completely eliminating the other. However, if one of those two sides were infinite, of infinite power, uh, of infinite scope, there would be no reason to suppose the other could continue to exist because it would be entirely wiped out. You put another way, we would think that if one contrary is infinite in scope, not merely infinite in power, but infinite in, in the way that it exists in all of reality in a totalizing way, its opposite, its contrary, could not exist at all. To bring up an analogy, we could say that it's something like that there would be no room for this other contrary. All right. So Aquinas' second objection here. He says, Further, it is superfluous to suppose 
that what can be accounted for by a few principles has been produced by many. But it seems that everything we see in the world can be accounted for by other principles, supposing God did not exist. For all natural things can be reduced to one principle, which is nature, and all voluntary things can be reduced to one principle, which is human reason or will. Therefore, there is no need to suppose God's existence. This is the other major objection that we see even today. We often see the problem of evil standing right alongside this objection, the objection from science. Uh, or we might, to use a more sophisticated philosophical term, the objection from parsimony, the inference to the best or most simple explanation. Uh, this is uh, based on a principle which comes to be known as Occam's razor, uh, which was a long-standing medieval principle. Occam's name just sort of gets attached to it for, um, for minute little historical reasons. In any case, right, this is the point with, of this objection is to ask, why do we need God to explain anything about the world? It seems to be the case that we can explain everything that we need to explain physically or psychologically. We can explain human choices and human actions with reference to the human mind. We can explain the physicality of the world, the causes and effects that we observe with reference to physics, physical interactions of physical things, mental interactions between mental things, we might even say today, go further than this, uh, and say that we can even reduce one to the other. Most of the time, that involves reducing the mental to the physical, explaining psychology in terms of physics. And if we can explain the entire world, everything there is to know about the world, in terms of pure physics, physical causation, why do we need God, this supernatural explanation to explain the natural world at all. And if God is this sort of superfluous hypothesis, well, why should we suppose this additional hypothesis that we don't need? We don't do that in any other field of study. We don't do that in the sciences. We don't do that any time that we're trying to explain something. If something can be explained by fewer principles, that should be the preferable explanation. Uh, of course, Aquinas does not stop there. Aquinas famously posits his five ways of proving the existence of God, which, again, I've gone over elsewhere and needn't go over in detail here. However, he then goes on to uh, answer each of these two objections uh, that are proposed by both others and even as presented by St. Thomas himself. So first, as his way of um, answering uh, what is called the logical problem of evil, distinct from a couple of other versions, which, as I said, I'll, I'll discuss in another video. In his way of answering this logical problem of evil, he says, uh, he says um, essentially, all he needs to do is come up with some possible theodicy. Now, a theodicy is, again, a, 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 a hypothetical or a possible explanation for how and why God could have done something. Now, why do we need only a hypothetical? Why do we not need an actual explanation? Well, again, if the objection is trying to point out a logical inconsistency or a logical impossibility, all we need to show in order to refute that objection is a logical possibility. It doesn't have to be the right answer. It just needs to be a possible answer. And if we can show a possible answer, what that means is, what we've done is we've reconciled the apparent contradiction between the existence of God, that is, ultimate goodness, and the apparent existence of evil. So how does he do this? Well, he quotes St. Augustine, who says, Since God is the highest good, he would not allow any evil to exist in his works, unless his omnipotence and goodness were such as to bring good even out of evil. Aquinas continues, this is part of the infinite goodness of God, that he should allow evil to exist and out of it produce good. Essentially, he's providing a very generalized theodicy. He is saying that it is logically possible for God to permit, again, important to note, permit, not cause, 
certain evils to exist in the world, to exist within creation, so long as some good can be brought out of those evils. Now, different, th different philosophers and different thinkers will, will, um, will insist that this has to be a certain type of good right, for this theodicy to work. Some will be satisfied by saying some good must be brought out of it, right? that this evil must give rise to some good. Others will go further. We'll explain that this, this good that must be brought out of evil must be greater than the evil that brings it about, that allows it to come to be. Others will say that this, this good could not have existed were it not for this evil to have existed prior to it. This is all open for discussion. However, um, whichever case we take here, all of them seem to be plausible. All of them seem to show that it is at least logically possible for God to permit evil things. Because through those evil things, good things arise from them. We might say, for example, human suffering. We, we all suffer throughout our lives. Uh, we might ask, why does God permit this to happen? But we all have had instances where we have suffered and learned from it, where we have grown as people, where our souls have developed even. Uh, and again, theologically, right, uh, religiously even, we have, this, we have this concept of redemptive suffering, of suffering and growing from it to the point of uh, growing closer to God, growing closer to those around us, right, growing, growing closer to our neighbors. And so we have in this case, a theodicy for what would otherwise be unexplained instances of evil. Now, there are other answers to this question as well, the logical problem. Uh, and as I said, I've gone over some of those in the past. I'll go over some of those in the future as well. Um, but this, again, is Aquinas' answer, and it is broad enough to cover just about any version of the logical problem of evil. He simply points out that there must be some kind of theodicy. All right, so what about the other objection? Objection number two, the objection from science or from parsimony. Well, Aquinas says, since nature works for a determinate end under the direction of a higher agent, whatever is done by nature must needs be traced back to God as its first cause. So also, whatever is done voluntarily must also be traced back to some higher cause other than human reason or will, since these ch things can change or fail. For all things that are changeable and capable of defect must be traced back to an immovable and self-necessary first principle, as was shown in the body of the article. This is a common technique from from St. Thomas in his objections and his, his responses to the objections to simply refer back to the body of the argument, to his reply. Um, here, at least, he explains why that is done, okay? what, uh, what point he made in the body of the article um, such that it answers this objection. Uh, it's worth noting here that sometimes he doesn't even go so far as to say that. He says something along the lines of the rest of the objections are answered in the, in the article, uh, in the body of the article, or something like something along those lines. Here, though, thankfully, we do get uh, enough detail as to what exactly um, about his article, about his five ways, counters this objection from science or from parsimony or from inference to uh, the simplest explanation. So he points out, as he does throughout the five ways, that natural principles, causal explanations within the world, need to be traced back to something beyond nature. And that is because the causal mechanisms of the world, or the things which follow those causal mechanisms, are not self-explanatory, even as a total system. The same will apply, of course, to human reason and human will. He points out that our choices are not self-explanatory. The reason for this is that we, ourselves, are not self-explanatory. We do not carry within ourselves reasons for our own existence. This relates most closely back uh, to Aquinas' third way, the argument from contingency. Although you can, uh, you can make arguments that this applies to, uh, to any of the five. 
With respect to the argument from contingency, we can see this, I think, most clearly. We point out that the entire structure of the cosmos, all of these causal influences, uh, which are going one to the other, right? so things that are describable in terms of physics, if this is the case, um, all of those causal interactions, all of the things which interact causally with one another in this way, are themselves contingent. They could have been another way. They did not need to be the way that they are. And so, therefore, each of these things requires an explanation. And it's not enough for them to explain one another. They need an ultimate explanation for all of them, because the entire set of physical events, physical things, could have failed to exist, or could have existed differently. And so we need a necessary explanation. Of course, the same applies to human beings, to finite creatures. We are finite. I came into being at some point, and I may, of course, pass out of being at some point. Even in the interim, I may be differently than I am now. For example, now, I could be in the other room. There's nothing necessary about my being right here, right now. In fact, while you're watching this, I'm almost certainly not in this physical location. I'm somewhere else. I'm likely wearing different clothes. I'm likely looking in a different direction. I may not have my glasses on. I may be wearing contacts. I may be asleep. Who knows? I needn't be here right now. Why I am requires an explanation. Again, more on this, of, of course, I go into more detail on this when I discuss Aquinas' five ways. Um, but suffice it to say that even these basic principles do not ultimately explain themselves. That is, human reason and will on the one hand, and physics on the other. There is a deeper level of explanation required. It's not enough to refer to the interrelationship between finite things in the created world. We need to go deeper and further than that in order to explain everything that there is. And that, as he says, leads us to God. All right. That about sums up Aquinas's two objections uh, and his responses to them. So hopefully this was rather informative and hopefully this links together with some of the other things that we've talked about and, ta and some of the other things that we discussed, uh, especially Aquinas' other arguments, especially some of the other arguments for and against the existence of God. So with that, I'll see you next time.